there, good morning, Joshua here. Uh, hello to all the house churches out there. I wish I could be with you, um, but I just can't be everywhere at once. I'm not omnipresent. Uh, please, if you would, open up in a Bible to the Gospel of Mark chapter 8. This is where we'll be today. We're continuing in our Jesus is King series today. And as we start today, I just want to recap a little bit of where we've been in the past three or four weeks. A couple weeks ago, we, we started in the first 10 verses of chapter 8, where Jesus again uh, performed a similar miracle as he did in chapter 6. And, and he turned a few bread and, and some fish into food for 4,000 people. And this was Jesus' compassion on display. This was God's heart to love people right where they were at, whether those people had proven their faith in Jesus uh, or, or whether they, they had even said that they loved God at all. God just cared for them. Jesus, God in the flesh, in that moment was showing his mercy and compassion for people. I read this the other day on Twitter from an old professor of mine, uh, Preston Sprinkle. He said this, he said, Jesus upheld a ridiculously high standard of obedience and yet excessively loved those who fell short of it. Go and do likewise. And this is what we have been seeing from Jesus over and over again in Mark, especially in the last few weeks. We continued on in chapter 8 and we saw this strange continuing theme of blindness. The Pharisees, they weren't getting what Jesus was doing. They couldn't see it. The disciples aren't immediately getting what Jesus is all about. The crowds aren't really understanding. And then we come to verse 29. And Jesus wants to know if any of his disciples are even on the verge of understanding what he's all about. If they're even on the verge of understanding who the Messiah is meant to be. Do any of you even get who I am? What I'm all about? Jesus is kind of leaning in. And so let's pick up again in chapter 8, starting in verse 29. I'm going to read this whole section, then I'll pray for us today, and then we'll work from there. Chapter 8, starting in verse 29, And he, Jesus, asked his disciples, Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, You are the Christ. And then Jesus strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Verse 31, and Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Chapter 9 verse 1 says, and he said to them, truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Let me pray for us today. Jesus, I pray that we could begin to understand you. Lord, would you reveal yourself in a deeper in a more illuminating way today. 
God, I pray that we wouldn't just be people who pridefully assume always that we just know exactly who God is, what he's saying, what he's, what he's all about, but, but we would instead be people who, who look to you, who we, we ask the Holy Spirit, God, what are you wanting to teach us? What are you wanting to show us? Lord, would you illuminate the scriptures for us? God, I pray that you would teach us today and that you would just reveal who is the Messiah meant to be in our lives and what what does it mean for us to live um, as we understand who you are. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. There's this time in college where I had a professor who sat, started out one of our class periods uh, this one one time with an incredibly sharp correction of everyone in the class. I loved this professor. I respected him so much. He, he was amazing. And I remember he stood up and the first thing he said that this one class period was this, some of you are so ridiculous with the way that you hold so tightly to your different human philosophies that you don't even leave room to begin to hear God even possibly speak to you. He went on correcting us, a little bit tearing into us. And and I'm sure maybe for some of you this might sound scary, um, maybe a little bit too much. But in context, this professor knew us all really well. He was a very relational teacher And this correction was actually coming from a place of him having spent a lot of time with all of us as students, had a lot of conversations with us. And this moment, I remember actually feeling appropriately challenged. I remember thinking, I really need to consider what my professor is saying right now. Maybe there are some things that I've assumed my entire life that are actually wrong assumptions. There's probably things that, that, that I have believed that are flat out wrong, assumptions that might even be hurting me. Side note, um, did you know that in the early days of the Tour de France, that cyclists actually believed that cigarettes would open up their lungs. They would actually fill their water bottles with beer and wine because they thought it was good kind of sports nutrition to numb their bodies as they they climbed uh, just tons of elevation. I mean, these cyclists, even in the early days of the Tour de France, were, were going over 1,500 miles and there's these really funny pictures of, of the, f- the first uh, years of the Tour de France where you would see cyclists passing cigarettes back and forth to one another while they were, that, while they were riding. Um, we know now that that's terrible sports nutrition. Cigarettes are obviously terrible for your lungs. And if you're wanting to go climb a mountain or do like 2,000 to 5,000 feet in elevation, you don't want to smoke cigarettes. It's the worst plan you could ever make or drink beer or wine. We know that's terrible. You would never see Lance Armstrong doing something like that now. But haven't you ever looked back and realized that you previously assumed something as incredibly normal, but now realize it was, it was wrong. And this is part of what maturing as a human is. This is kind of the human experience. And so today in Mark 8, Jesus corrects our wrong assumptions. Obviously not about cycling and cigarettes, but Jesus corrects our assumptions of who people think the Messiah, the Christ, is supposed to be. Jesus sets the record straight. And so today, there are two basic questions that this text begins to answer for us. And and I just want to think through these today. Number one, who is the Messiah not supposed to be? And number two, who is the Messiah supposed to be? And so first off, Who is Jesus, the Messiah, not supposed to be? Obviously, as we're working through the Gospel of Mark, 
Mark does not write for us a full theological textbook on understanding the Messiah. Like this is who the Messiah is supposed to be, a, a theological textbook. And in side note, I'm actually really thankful that the Bible does not present itself like a textbook. It's never really written in that way. Rather, I just want you to think about this. We get a really rich history, sometimes poetry even, beautiful stories of redemption and struggle and healing. And and this is how we receive theology from the scriptures. This is how God explains himself through the stories of humans, through, through poetry even. Thank God it's not a textbook or an encyclopedia. I'm thankful for this. So Mark helps us to understand the purposes of Jesus as the Messiah through this story here in chapter 8 with Peter and the disciples. And so back to verse 29, Peter says to Jesus, you are the Christ. And so Christ means Messiah in Greek. A few verses down, it says, then that Jesus began to teach them. And so what's happening here? Peter has just revealed, it's been revealed in Peter's heart that Jesus, his identity is that he's the Christ, the Messiah. And in this moment, as the disciples are coming to a deeper understanding of Jesus, Jesus takes this as an opportunity to teach. Jesus is thinking something like, All right, now that you're starting to understand on a deeper level, I'm actually now going to begin to teach you on a deeper level. Now that you understand a little bit, I'm going to teach you just a little bit more. And I'm such a nerd. By the way, this just sounds so Yoda, Star Wars-esque. Yoda has the, I think, classic line in Empire Strikes Back where he says, you must unlearn what you have learned. I feel like Yoda kind of stole that line from Jesus. Anyway, this lesson from Jesus now suddenly takes a sharp turn as Peter shows that he has some major assumptions about who the Messiah is supposed to be. Jesus is is teaching his disciples. This is what the purpose of the Messiah is. And and, uh, Jesus says that the Messiah is to be killed and then after three days to rise again. And in verse 32 says that Jesus said this plainly. And then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Jesus, the rabbi, is teaching his kind of master class, if you will, on messiahship. And can you imagine, in the middle of this, Peter, the student, not only just disrupts the class and interrupts Jesus to correct him, he actually stands up and rebukes him. The word that Mark uses here for rebuke is actually the same word that's used throughout other gospels when when Jesus is rebuking demons. This word would only be used when when someone is confronting horrible evil. Peter is so angry. His response is, is completely visceral from his gut. You can see that Peter believes that Jesus is so wrong. Jesus, no, you don't get it. This is what's happening in this moment. Can you imagine the scene? Peter, Peter is about to overturn some tables himself. And then this classic Jesus moment follows here. And Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And so you can see that Peter is assuming That the Messiah is meant to to live out and, and, and to play out in a certain way. Peter has assumptions about who the Messiah is supposed to be. And then Jesus corrects those assumptions. So we're finding out who the Messiah is not in this moment. And the Messiah is not meant to win. I'll say it just one more time. Who is the Messiah not? The Messiah is not meant 
to win, at least in the ways that we would assume a Messiah, a king, would win. Real quick here, what do we think Peter's assumption about the Messiah actually was? Most likely, Peter would have assumed, along with with many uh, of his Jewish counterparts of the day, he would have assumed that the Messiah was supposed to be a conquering Messiah, not a suffering Messiah. The disciples actually show in a number of moments throughout the Gospels and in Acts, the beginning of Acts, that they expected the Messiah to be a kind of political warrior king, or maybe like a president, if you will. The disciples were looking for a warrior king type who would destroy Rome by the sword and vindicate the people of God, Israel. But then here comes Jesus and he begins to teach them about who the Messiah is is meant to be, what he's supposed to do. And the Messiah was to be killed. This sounds crazy to them. Honestly, it makes so much sense that that Peter is angry in this moment. He sees what Jesus is saying as evil, maybe on the level of demonic. Imagine if your team captain of of your local softball league, yes, I, I think we should all join a softball league here soon. Imagine if your team captain stood up and said at the beginning of the season, our purpose is to lose every game. This is why I'm here as your captain. This is what our team is all about. We are here to lose it all. I don't care how non-competitive, how non-sporty you are. You would be ticked off. What are you talking about? Like what, what a lame team captain speech is that for us to start off the season. But the Messiah did not come to win in the way that we would assume. And this was difficult for Peter to hear and understand and to grasp. Peter's been spending so much time with with this man. He's been having hope this could be him. This is our Messiah, our King. He's going to vindicate us. This was difficult. And I actually think this is really difficult for us today. Our culture right now, I think more than ever, operates in a team versus team kind of mentality. In so many ways, we view ourselves, even those of you who aren't competitive again, we view ourselves in terms of teams. And the goal of the team is to dominate, to win, and to shame the opposition. And maybe you don't consciously live this way, But this is in the air that our culture is currently breathing. If you're on team Apple, you shame the people who are making your text, your group text green. If you're on team coffee, then you think tea is stupid. Tea is not just an alternative. It's dumb. Why would you drink tea? I'm sure you can tell I might be on team coffee. If you think beaches are better than mountains, then we're enemies because I'm on team mountain. Why would you ever choose sand, getting your car? Mountains are incredible. They're so beautiful. We make a team out of everything. We have team liberal and team conservative. Uh, Unfortunately, this is ridiculous to me. We have team male and team female and we're against each other, not for each other. We may not say these things always out loud, but we often act in a way that shows that we are committed to our team and we hate to lose more than anything else. For better or for worse, we, especially in the West, are a people who love to win. And the very strange truth of Jesus is that his way of winning is most often a path that really looks to us like losing. Jesus' way is to lay it all down. 
his way is to die, to be rejected, and ultimately living out a life that looks a lot like what we call losing. The king of the universe came to be killed. He came to be laughed at, mocked, and rejected by the powers and authorities of the day. Would you ever have thought to write a story like that? None of us would. But consider this for a moment. What might happen if there was a group of people who rose up to follow the way of Jesus, who finally just said, we don't need to win. We don't have an ax to grind. We're dropping our ax. You may fire away at us with bombs, but we're not firing back. You may insult us, but we will never degrade you. Our aim is not to conquer anyone. What might happen if there is a movement in our world of people, a movement like this that swept the globe? It may sound strange, but this is Jesus' way of winning. To choose to put down his fists and instead absorb the chaos. To absorb the anger, the rage, the violence of the world. Jesus takes violence and aggression and he absorbs it with no retaliation. What might happen if this is how many people in our world began to respond? We don't have an axe to grind. And this leads us into the last part of our scripture today. Let's read it one more time, starting in verse 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. This is where our second question derives from today. Who is the Messiah supposed to be? We've been talking about who the Messiah is not, but who is he supposed to be? The Messiah did not come as a conquering warrior king, but the Messiah is supposed to be a suffering servant. So the simple answer is right here from this text. Jesus is one who will lose his life so that he can save it. Jesus isn't just preaching a way of discipleship to people that he's not going to then show them himself. This is Jesus' way. He will lose his life in order to redeem all of humanity. He's calling us to the same thing. Jesus will suffer in sacrifice as his way of winning the world. This is how Jesus wins. Like, don't mistake me today. Jesus wins. It's just confounding to us as humans as to the way he's choosing to win. His way of bringing peace rather than chaos. His way of being the prototype human to end the cycle of violence and chaos in the world. His way is to take up the cross. This is the ultimate moment of him absorbing the violence, the rage, the chaos, the madness of our world. The cross is who the Messiah is supposed to be. And and so very simple question, what does this mean for us who follow him? It means that our lives should be shaped by the cross. This is sometimes called uh, cruciformity, to live in a cruciformed way 
that our life would be shaped like the cross, that we see our life through the lens of the cross. We should actually expect our lives to be shaped by laying down our preferences, laying down our our privileges, laying down our freedoms, laying down our money, our whole lives as a way of bringing peace into the world, as a way of of bringing redemption and healing. This is Jesus' way. This is the cruciformed way, and it's our way. This is what Jesus is calling us Two, whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. What in the world do you think that might mean? It's a cruciformed, cross-shaped way. I want to end with this. I love how Eugene Peterson, uh, just the way he translates this verse I just read, I just wanted you to listen to these words it's a bit different. Um, But I think it really helps. Um, This is from the message translation there of Mark 8, um, starting in verse 34. It says this, calling the crowd to join his disciples. He said, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. That's Jesus speaking. He says, you're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to saving yourself, your true self. What good would it do to get everything you want and lose you, the real you? What could you ever trade your soul for? I love this. This is so good. It says, don't run from suffering. Embrace it. And so I end today for us in our house churches with these just couple of questions. What might this mean for us as a church? What might it look like if there were a group of people that rose up who instead of always looking to win and shame people who don't believe or think or look the same as us, what if there were a group of people who rose up who were looking to sacrifice and serve? How might that change the world? How might this kind of people change the world? How might even us as a small church, if we began to look more like this, how could that change our communities, change our workplaces, change our families, our friend relationships? If you didn't need to always win, but you were a servant, even willing to sacrifice or even suffer for the sake of others, for the sake of the truth of the gospel, because you know Jesus, because he loves you, because you've received the love of the Father. You don't need to win. 